Okay, hi. Uh, so before I start, I just want to say thanks to the organizers uh, for putting in all the work to organize this conference. And thanks for giving me a chance to present some of the work I'm going to talk about today. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jonathan Braden. I'm a postdoc at CETA in Toronto. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work I've been doing on developing a real-time picture of vacuum decay. There. So just a quick outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to start by reviewing what I mean by vacuum decay and first order phase transitions. Uh, I'll then briefly review many years of history on sort of the standard description of this process, uh, which is the Euclidean bounce formalism. And this is mostly to provide sort of predictions for what I expect this new formalism we've been developing should, should give. I will then describe the real-time description of the problem that we have come up with uh, and compare this to the Euclidean results. I'll then briefly mention a possibility to actually experimentally build a system that undergoes false vacuum decay in the laboratory, uh, and then some quick conclusions and some future applications of this, these results. Right. So what do I mean by false vacuum decay? So what I want to imagine is that we have a field, uh, and the key thing is uh, this field has some potential that has multiple minima in it, OK? So here I've got a potential with three minima, but you know, exactly how many is not important. And one of these minima is a local minimum, but not a global minimum, OK? And now we want to imagine that somehow we've put a large region of, of the universe, or maybe our lab, uh, so that it's localized at this um, local minimum that's not the global minimum, which is known as a false vacuum. Now, if you were just doing classical mechanics with a ball, it would just sit there forever. But of course, in the real world, you can have things like thermal fluctuations, or someone could come along and perturb the system by hitting it from an externally. You could have defects. And all of these things can sort of drive the system to go over the barrier and end up uh, in this minimum. Uh, you can also have another effect, which is quantum mechanical in nature, which is that quantum mechanics forces you to have quantum fluctuations in here. And so in quantum mechanics, what would happen in this case is there would be a tunneling process that would take you through the barrier to emerge on this other side. And so in field theory, with an extended uh, configuration space, so infinitely many particles, there's some analogous process. And so this is the process I'm going to be studying. And so the way that this is supposed to happen is not that you tunnel the entire region all at once. Instead, you will make little bubbles, where inside the bubble, you're sitting on this side of the barrier, and outside, you're still sitting in the false vacuum. And so inside of the bubble, you can have negative energy. Where, and in order to connect onto the false vacuum, you have to have some sort of boundary layer or wall or something like that, and have, that has a surface tension associated with it. So you can balance the energy and the surface tension off with the negative energy inside the bubble. Uh, and this allows you to make a zero energy solution that describes a transition from the false vacuum to the true vacuum, okay? And then these bubbles will expand and eventually run into each other and you will complete the phase transition, okay? So this is the picture you should have in mind. And here's an example in the real world uh, uh, where someone has come along and taken this metastable system and given it an external kick, and this causes a bubble to form, which then starts to expand out and swallow up the whole bubble. So what I'm going to be discussing is the analog of this process where that transition happens because of quantum mechanics, not because of thermal fluctuations or external perturbations. So there are lots of questions you could ask about this process. Uh, sort of some zeroth order ones are, how fast does the vacuum decay? Do you get bubbles? Uh, if you do get bubbles, what do they look like? And so there's a very well-known and standard framework for addressing these, uh, which is the Euclidean bounce formalism, uh, which is originally due to Coleman, but there's my, many, many, many people have worked on this. Uh, so this is a very quick overview just to set the stage for the rest of the talk. So, what this formalism does is it attempts to compute the vacuum to vacuum transition amplitude squared, okay? And what you will generally find is that this decays as e to the minus uh, gamma t or gamma sum decay rate. And so this is then interpreted as decay of the false vacuum as time goes on, okay? And so the way to compute this gamma is you first go to Euclidean time. So you remove all time dependence from the system by doing this, okay? And then you want to extremize the Euclidean action, okay? And so you make some more approximations. And at the end of the day, what, what this amounts to is you want to solve the following boundary value problem, OK? So this just is, is the equation of motion. And then you have a boundary condition at the origin to ensure the solution is smooth. 
and then you have a boundary condition in infinity that ensures that you started in the false vacuum. And I will discuss the interpretation of these solutions in a second. Uh, but all you have to do is solve this equation. And you look for solutions that have one negative eigenmode. And once you've found them, you plug them back into the action. So you get a value for the Euclidean action for these. You subtract off the action of the false vacuum. And the decay rate is then given, including the first two orders in h bar by this formula. Okay. And so the key thing is this Euclidean action you've computed uh, shows up in the exponent and then is a prefactor. And this extra fluctuation determinant piece is associated with quantum fluctuations around that, that solution. And it sort of stores the dimensionful information about, about the decay process. All right. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on a specific model so I can do calculations. And so the model is this, uh, it's basically a sign Gordon model with a perturbing potential. So there are three parameters in here. One is phi naught, which just changes the overall uh, width of the potential. V naught, which changes the overall height. And lambda, which changes the actual shape of the potential. So you can, you can think about changing phi naught as changing the value of h bar. Roughly, you can think of changing V naught as changing the mass of the field. And then lambda actually changes the depth of this well, so the like real shape properties of the potential. Okay. And I will get to why I picked this potential at the end of the talk. All right, so given this, uh, we can now use the Euclidean formalism to compute our, our expected nucleation rate of bubbles or decay rate of the false vacuum. Uh, so remember it has this form where I've pulled out some dimensionful factors uh, and this G is some order one function associated with the fluctuation determinant. Okay, and so now I'm going to go to one plus one spatial dimension, one plus one dimensions uh, for reasons that I'll explain in a bit, okay? And I wanna compute this SI where I've pulled out some scaling factor, some area factor, and I'm gonna compute this C numerically. And when you do that for various values of lambda, you get this very nice curve, okay? So this will provide a prediction for the decay rate that we expect to see. All right. Now, the next thing that we wanted to know is do bubbles form, what do they look like? So that means you need to go back to real time, have an actual real time description. Uh, so the obvious thing you might think to do is I've got this, this bounce solution. And so somehow this should, should be related to the bubbles. So maybe you think you should analytically continue it back. If you do that, what you will find is that this does not describe nucleation of a bubble. It describes an infinitely large bubble contracting, hitting some minimum turnaround radius and then re-expanding, okay? So this is not decay process. So what you do to restore time dependence is you just sort of ad hoc say, I'm gonna cut this bubble along some time axis, okay? And now I'm gonna declare that because in quantum mechanics, this is a tunneling process, I'm gonna have a quantum tunneling event where a bubble will just nucleate much like a particle just appears on the other side of the barrier. And when that happens, I'm gonna take this cut bubble profile and just space, paste it into the space time and then evolve it forward in, in time. So an important thing to note is that if this picture is correct, if I were to backward evolve this thing in time, I get the expanding bubble back. So there's no real time evolution that can connect the state before you had the bubble to the state with only the bubble in it, okay? So that's the standard formalism, just a lightning overview form. So this allows you to answer some interesting questions, uh, but there's plenty of other things you might wanna ask that you can't really tackle. So you might wanna know, is there actually a time dependent description? If I'm watching the false vacuum boil, I could video record it and I get a nice time stream. Uh, do we really need to go to Euclidean time? Okay, and things like, are there bubble precursors in the field? Uh, what are the initial conditions when it nucleates? You know, are there correlations between the bubbles? Uh, what happens if I have very fast decays, the fluctuations are very large? What if the background is time evolving or the potential is time evolving? And then in that case, I can't do this Euclidean rotation. And it's a bit implicit in the, the Euclidean formalism, but you automatically pick out the vacuum state. So what happens if you're trying to decay from a non-vacuum state? Okay, so these are questions that you can't really answer in the Euclidean formalism, so you need a different formalism to, do, to approach them. Okay, so in the perfect world, all you would do is just say, well, I have my initial wave function, I'm gonna just solve the Schrodinger equation. So you can do that in quantum mechanics, but in quantum field theory, the phase space is exponentially large, so it's totally hopeless. So you need some sort of approximation scheme to, to study this problem. So what we would like is to have a nice time-dependent way of sort of understanding how this quantum foamy part at the initial stages turns into this nice coherent classical bubble that's evolving, okay? And so here is the proposal that we have, okay? 
So let's recall what quantum mechanics does for us. It does two things. Number one, we get the uncertainty principle. So we can't localize phi and phi dot. And second, there's interference of amplitudes, okay? So let's for a second just ignore interference of amplitudes and just say, I'm gonna impose the uncertainty principle. So I'm gonna start with a field that's sitting in the false vacuum, okay? Now this, of course, does not obey the uncertainty principle. So to do that, we're gonna add some fluctuations in, okay? And in, in principle, these are again, some operators, but let's just treat them as draws of a Gaussian random field, okay? And we're gonna demand that the Gaussian random fields have the same two point statistics as the Minkowski vacuum, okay? So quantum mechanics is saying, we looked at, at our initial false vacuum, we got a sample of it, okay? Now we're gonna forget about quantum mechanics and we're just gonna do classical time evolution from there, okay? So we're gonna take this draw out of the ensemble of, of false vacuum fields. Okay, we're gonna grab our computer and throw that in there. We're also gonna throw in some code. And all this code is gonna do is solve the relativistic Klein-Borg equation. So just classical nonlinear time evolution, okay? So we think that what should happen is that we should see the false vacuum decay and it should decay via bubbles. So what we expect to see is there's some time evolution where you're fluctuating around the false vacuum and at some point a bubble will appear and it will start to expand. And I'm gonna show you a one plus one dimensional simulation. So a bubble here is really a domain wall, anti-domain wall pair, where between them you're close to the true vacuum and, and away from them you're, you're sitting in the false vacuum. So let's see what happens if I run one of these simulations. Okay, so what I have here is blue is field values near the, the false vacuum, red is near the true vacuum. And as you can see, as I time evolve this way, it's fluctuating around the false vacuum and bang, a bubble pops into existence here. So this is a purely classical time evolution and it shows you that it is a mechanism that can allow the false vacuum to decay, okay? So that's already a novel result that if you thought it was a tunneling process cannot happen, all right. Now, I'm not gonna show it here, but you can run the same types of simulations in 2D and 3D and again, you can see that you can nucleate bubbles, okay? All right, so now, are these really the same as these bu bubbles that we expect in the instanton formalism? So this is work in progress, but one obvious thing you can look at, as I said before, the instanton bubbles have zero energy. So we can ask, what is the energy of this bubble? Well, the first thing is there's a lot of like short wavelength noise in here, and that just sort of contributes to zero point energy, so we wanna get rid of that. So let's start by smoothing the field, okay? So we just apply a filter to the field to smooth out those long wavelengths and kind of get the bubble structure out. All right, now we're gonna compute the energy density of this particular thing. And when we do that, what we see is we have this interior region with negative energy because it's sitting near the, the true vacuum and it's bounded by these regions of positive energy which are surface tension of the bubble, okay? And so now we can just ask how much energy is in these field configurations. And when we do that, we see it's quite small. Now we haven't projected out all of the zero point modes. So there's still some residual vacuum energy in there. But if I plotted the, the energy density of the original fluctuations, uh, it's about 30 on this scale. So it's off the screen, okay? And these different curves are increasing levels of smoothing as I move this way. And so as you can see, uh, it looks like we have something that is close to a zero energy bubble that is nucleating in the system. And you can compare this as well to just saying, instead of doing this on these uh, sampled quantum fluctuation simulations, I'm just gonna paste in the instanton solution and let it run and apply the same filtering procedure. You'll get curves that look very, very similar to the one that I have here, okay? So this is good preliminary evidence that these really are zero energy vacuum bubbles and not some like very high energy fluctuations throwing you over the barrier, okay. All right, so. Now the final thing we need to check is the decay rates, okay? And so again, we have predictions for these. And the important thing I want you to notice here is that we know how the exponent scales with the finite parameter in our potential, okay? And the C is some number that we can predict. So the way to see if we have the correct C is to run simulations with everything fixed except varying finite, okay? And so we need to get the decay rate in each of these simulations. So the way we do this is if we have one of these simulations, okay, we can identify a time when the bubble decayed, all right? And now, instead of just running one simulation, we run many, 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 many lattice simulations. So we Monte Carlo over the initial conditions and each Monte Carlo sample is a full lattice simulation. And this is why I'm doing one dimension, okay? 
because to get good statistics for a given model, you need something on the order of 10,000 simulations. And then to make sure that everything scales the way it should, there are no numerical artifacts, I ran something on the order of 1,000 models. Okay, so this is like 10 million simulations. So feasibility is an important issue if you're running 10 million live simulations. And so 1D is a good place to start to test the method. Uh, right now, I'm working on extending this to doing 2D. 3D is probably just hopeless. Okay. So now once you have that, you can figure out the probability in the, this ensemble of simulations you've made that at a given time, uh, we haven't nucleated a bubble yet. And so each of these curves is plotting this survival probability for a fixed value of phi naught. And then as I increase phi naught, I get these curves moving this way. So the first thing to notice is that we do get this really nice exponential decay, okay? This is, it comes out without having to put it in by hand. It's just a result. And so by fitting, we can grab gamma, okay? And as an important sanity check, you know that the decay rate should scale with the length side length of the, of the simulation. So I did that, it all scales properly, okay? This is one of those important numerical checks. All right, so now we have gammas for a bunch of phi knots, and we know exactly what our original prediction was. So we can compare our decay rate as a function of phi naught versus the instant found result. And when we do this, we get this, this result. So the only thing I'm assuming in here is that this G is some order one number, okay? That is the only unknown in the whole thing. And so we are actually exponentially sensitive to this C on this plot, okay? So the orange uh, line is the result of the simulations and the blue and gray dashed lines are basically um, calculations from the instanton formalism making different assumptions about exactly what the functional form of this fluctuation determinant is, okay? Again, given that we're exponentially sensitive, this is a really, really remarkable fit, okay? So combined with the fact that we get bubbles, they seem to have zero energy and their, their rate of nucleation seems to be very similar to the instanton, this suggests that this really is capturing some sort of process that is the false vacuum decay by tunneling that people usually discuss. All right. Now, so, so far I've given you some approximate method and compared it to some other approximate quantum field theory method. Uh, you'd really like to know, can I build one of these things? Can I test this? Can I see if this is actually what's happening in the system? And a remarkable thing is that this actually does appear to be possible. So the way that you can do this is to consider dilute gas, cold atom, Bose-Einstein condensates. Okay, and so these are well described by sort of complex fields. Okay, and so now we're gonna take two BECs that we've condensed to approximately zero temperature. Okay, and now we're gonna couple them together in a specific way. So depending on the, exactly what BEC you're using, you maybe shine a laser on them. You can change the shape of the trap that they're trapped in. There's various ways to engineer your experiment to do this. And when you do, uh, what you will find is that the dynamics of the relative phase between these two condensates uh, obeys the same type of equation as a relativistic scalar field, or, or alternatively, it has an effective action that is the same as a relativistic scalar field. And so I can give more details of this in discussion, uh, but just take my word for it that you can show that this is true. And so of course, this is a phase, so any potential you generate is periodic, but again, by some uh, appropriate engineering of the system, you can actually generate this potential that is a sine Gordon model plus a sine square that I was showing before. And so that's the origin of the, this model I've been studying so far in this talk, okay? All right, and so now uh, you can go ahead and you can do simulations of these BAC experiments, basically using a very similar philosophy to what I was using for the relativistic klein gordon equation. And again, lambda is this tunable parameter that will take you from being at a local maximum to a local minimum. So as you vary the parameter lambda, Okay, from top to bottom. If you start out at the maximum, you get the second order phase transition where there's a spin level instability. Uh, as you start to turn it into a minimum, you get kind of this very rapid first order phase transition where there's sort of bubbles, there's sort of not. And then when you actually make the well sufficiently deep, you will find well-defined bubbles forming in your simulation and expanding exactly like a first order phase transition. So, it really does look like, uh, at least within the theoretical framework usually used to describe BECs, that these systems do describe false vacuum decay. And so that's a really great thing because when you build one of these systems, quantum mechanics is in there. You don't have to make any theoretical approximations about what it looks like. All right. And so 
this experimental proposal is actually part of a, a larger um, consortium uh, called the Quantum Simulators for Fundamental Physics with this big group of international people that's trying to go after experimental signatures of quantum field theory. And so we're actually discussing things with uh, Zoran Hadzibabic at Cambridge, who's an experimentalist who, who works on cold atom PDCs. So we're very hopeful that we will get one of these experiments built and that we will actually be able to test these ideas in the lab. Okay, so just I'll quickly give you some conclusions of what I hope you take away from this talk. Uh, so the first thing is that quantum false vacuum decay can occur via purely classical time evolution uh, with quantum mechanics put into the initial state, as opposed to being a tunneling process with absolutely no classical dynamical description, okay? Now within, and if you look at the bubbles that you form, they really do appear to have the same properties as the instant time bubbles. Uh, okay. So if you compare the decay rates, you find that they sort of match the Euclidean calculations, which tells you this is either an alternative description of tunneling, uh, it's complementary decay channel to the instanton, or maybe there's some magic cancellation of amplitudes, okay? And then there's a very exciting possibility to maybe test this in the lab. Okay, and I'm out of time here. So I just wanna say thank you. And if you're interested and would like to know more, come talk to me in the discussion sessions.